Community Alliance for Global Justice is a grassroots membership-based organization that actually was founded by folks who helped to organize the protests against the World Tra Trade Organization in 1999. We were founded in 2001, but we take the, it very seriously, the, the importance of uh, educating about the WTO protests and the fact that it was a huge people's victory. Um, it wasn't just an, an enormous demonstration, but we actually uh, shut down the WTO and prevented them from further consolidating their power forever. So it was great great victory that we need to commemorate, and we'll do that together on November 30th, which is 20 years to the day of the big shutdown. Um, so we are very excited to welcome Tim Wise to Seattle. We've been planning this for a long time. Um, we spent time together in Senegal a year ago where we went to participate in the African Food Systems Conference put on by the uh, um, Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa and also their General Assembly where we are very proud to become a friend of ASFA. Um, and we just appreciate so much that there's a researcher shining a light on what the Gates Foundation is doing in Africa. Tim is doing the work that we wish we could do on the ground. Um, it's so important, so so excited to, to hear from you tonight more in depth about your work. And we're also so honored that Millian Belay came all the way here. Um, he's an incredibly busy person and I just, you know, I'm so grateful that you took the time to come back to Seattle. I know many of you probably heard him speak in 2014. Um, we're very proud to have, honored, to have organized the Africa-US Food Sovereignty Strategy Summit um, with eight leaders from Africa, and I've heard from many people who heard Milian that night, it was upstairs, um, that, and all of those leaders, just how incredibly powerful it was uh, to hear directly from those who are organizing for food sovereignty and against what the Gates Foundation represents in Africa. So it's just wonderful to have you back, and we can't believe that was five years ago. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'll now pass it off to CAGJ's organizing director, Simone Adler. Thank you all again for being here. Um, and one of the things that I help coordinate is our AgriWatch campaign. Um, and so tonight you'll hear more from our friends Tim and Milion about AGRA, which is the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, um, a multi-billion dollar initiative of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And AGRA promotes agricultural development that benefits transnational corporations and biotech industries that are monopolizing hybrid seeds and genetically modified seeds and staple crops, chemical fertilizers, and the like. So this is basically securing African farmers as a resource pool for the global north. Um, and many in the African food sovereignty movement call this neocolonialism because it is prioritizing Western interests over farmer self-determination. So as a private actor, the Gates Foundation is exerting a disproportionate influence on governments and policymaking, um, making it easier for these kinds of markets to be opened up to the big ag industry. Um, and our AgriWatch campaign is challenging this through our work to expose what the Gates Foundation is doing and expose what Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa is doing um, in their neocolonial efforts to corporatize African agriculture. Um, earlier today, we had an action, um, a rally outside of the Gates Foundation's headquarters here um, to call attention to these issues, and our friends here tonight joined us, which was really awesome. So if you would like to get involved in this kind of work and participate in, um, in our campaign, you can sign up in the back at our table, um, check us out online at cgj.org and on Facebook at CGJ Seattle and at AgriWatch, um, and let us know if you want to be involved in this kind of grassroots organizing in solidarity with the African food sovereignty movement. Um, and so with that, I'm really thrilled to introduce our guests for the evening, two leaders in the food sovereignty movement who are gonna share more about how small-scale farmers are impacted by climate change and what communities are demonstrating as the real solutions to hunger and poverty. Um, so Timothy A. Wise is a senior researcher at the Small Planet Institute and senior research fellow at Tufts University's Global Development Environment Institute. He previously served as executive director of the US-based organization Grassroots International, which is a member of the US Food Sovereignty Alliance that CAGJ is also a member of. And he is the author of Eating Tomorrow, Agribusiness, Family Farmers, and the Battle for the Future of Food, which was just published this year by New Press, um, which you can purchase tonight. Um, 
And Millian Belay is a researcher on the resilience of food systems in Ethiopia with the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. He has worked for over two decades on intergenerational learning of biocultural diversity, sustainable agriculture, and food sovereignty and forest issues. Um, and first, he was a founder of Melka Ethiopia, an indigenous organization, and now is coordinator of AFSA, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. AFSA advocates for agroecology and supporting the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples to their land. It's the largest civil society network in Africa. So with that, we welcome you both to town hall tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here, and thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here with, with Milion, who I have uh, worked with uh, on and off for, for several years now on, um, on some of these issues, and um, who has educated me a great deal about um, the, the struggles and aspirations of Africa's farmers. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the book, um, and why I wrote it, and um, what kind of the overarching, what the themes and, uh, and conclusions that came out of what turned into five years of research um, on three different continents. Um, the, um, then I'll talk, tell a little bit about, about um, what I think the battles for the future of food in Africa are looking like and what the stakes are there, and to some extent, the role of, of the Gates Foundation and the Alliance for a Green Revolution in that, in that process. Um, I mean, about the book, um, I, uh, I ended up with a really pretty book, don't you think? <laughs> um, if you talk to authors, they won't all say that, but my publisher, The New Press, pr produced a lovely book, and I'm very happy with it. Um, uh, it was very much a labor of love. I'm also very happy with the title, Eating Tomorrow, which um, uh, the, the title didn't come easy. I went for a long time with this book project without a, a, a good working title. Um, and I actually credit my current colleague, Frances Moore LePay, at the Small Planet Institute in Cambridge. She's the author of Diet for a Small Planet um, and 18 other books. She knows books. She gave, agreed to meet me before I was even working closely with her for a, uh, to give me feedback on an early book proposal. And we met for lunch in Cambridge. It was wonderful. She gave me great advice. The book is much better because of her advice in ways that I'll get credit for when you read it, but she gets credit for from me now. She also gets credit for the title because we brainstormed titles. She's good at titles. We didn't come up with anything we liked at this uh, over lunch. And I'm walking home, and uh, my phone rings. And I answer it, and I say, hi, Frankie. And she says, hey, Tim, what about eating tomorrow? And uh, I'm, <laughs> I really said, well, I enjoyed our lunch, Frankie. And I guess, <laughs> I mean, if you want. And she said, no, your book, the title of your book. And that is where the title of the book came from. Um, but I really, I, I really like. The, the double meaning really captures the, the essence of what, I, um, um, what I'm trying to communicate with this book, that humanity is obviously facing a huge challenge to make sure that everyone can eat today, and we're not doing a great job of it. The UN says two billion people suffer food insecurity in the world, and 800 million suffer chronic severe hunger. Um, that's not doing so well. And climate change is going to make it all the more challenging for us to be able to ensure that people can eat tomorrow. But the way we're producing our food on fossil fuel intensive, chemical intensive industrial scale farms is quite literally devouring the natural resource base on which future food production depends. The seeds, the soil, the water, the climate, the pollinators. Um, by continuing and expanding and exporting that model to parts of the world where it isn't dominant, um, we are eating our collective tomorrows, undermining our ability to ensure that everyone um, can eat tomorrow. Um, so I wrote this book because I have 30 years in this field, and I really wanted to understand why 
leaders, why policymakers around the world were ignoring all of the low-cost solutions all around them offered by their own small-scale farmers, and instead were opting for these expensive um, and ultimately ineffective approaches. The subtitle of the book, um, Agribusiness, Family Farmers, and the Battle for the Future of Food is kind of my diagnosis of the problem. There are battles for the future of food everywhere. That's actually good news. Nobody's taking this lying down. Nobody's letting people just take their land away. Um, but um, uh, agribusiness has largely hijacked the policy process nearly everywhere I went with their influence and their, um, and their dominance. And um, family farmers really need to be put back at the center of the policy agenda um, in order to, to recapture our, our, our food systems. The, the big question that everyone wants answered and, is, and that frames all of these discussions is how will we feed the world, right? That's, uh, that particularly grew in relevance when, um, and became more prevalent when food prices spiked 10 years ago. I don't know if people remember that. Food riots in 26 countries and um, the alarms went out that maybe Thomas Malthus was right after all, right? Maybe our resource, we, we'd outstripped our population, had outstripped our resources. Climate change was making that even more worrisome. And now we, we, we were desperate to, to uh, how would we feed the world? I argue in the book that this is a really important question with a lot of terrible answers. And most of the terrible answers involve producing more food that we need to solve this problem by producing more food. There's not a scarcity of food. That is something that Frances Moore LePay documented 50 years ago. 50 years ago, she wrote Diet for a Small Planet and argued that hunger was not the product of a scarcity of food. It was a product of a scarcity of power on the part of the poor. Food producers over food producing resources and poor people over income to be able to purchase food. Um, that's as true today as it was then. Um, and the FAO and um, international research researchers have documented this. The, the, we're currently experiencing what's called a global grain glut. Um, you, if any, anybody knows farmers, they'll tell you prices are really low because we're overproducing everything. The world is overproducing everything. There's not a shortage of food in the world. It's piled up outside silos all over the industrialized world. Um, but at the same time, the last three years, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization has documented that there's been a rise in chronic hunger. Three years, hung, rising hunger amid plenty. What's wrong with this picture? Why do we keep getting it so wrong is really the question I'm trying to answer in this book. Um, and one reason I argue that we're getting it so wrong is because that question, how do we feed the world, is really flawed in how we're framing it. So think about this. We all know who we mean when we say we, right? How will we feed the world? We mean the global north. We mean the industrialized countries. We mean our high yield, high tech agriculture. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're not feeding the world now. 70% of the food consumed in developing countries is grown in those countries. The majority of that food is grown by small-scale farmers. That's who's feeding the world or is trying to feed the world, and that's where hunger is. And there's no world waiting out there passively to be fed, which that question implies. The majority of the hungry in the world are in agricultural communities, and many of them are farmers. Most make some of their living from farming. They're not waiting passively to be fed. They're struggling daily to try to feed their, themselves and their families and their communities. Um, the obvious question is, why don't we give those food producers more resources to help them grow more food? That, unfortunately, is not the solution that I saw policymakers um, uh, opting for anywhere in the world. And I concluded that uh, that was largely because big corporate interests had really dominated the, the policy agenda and the policy process in, in every country that I, I cover in this book. So that's really the top line message that I want to deliver with this book. 
Um, but this book is um, not an academic book, um, I'm pleased to say. It's a, uh, a first-person narrative account um, where I'm trying to take you, the reader, along with me as I go out into the world to try to figure out what's going on. Um, uh, it took me to uh, Mexico, it took me to India, it took me to the heartland of the United States, and it took me to four countries in southern Africa, um, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, and Tanzania. Um, I consider myself a recovering economist. There is not a single table or graph in this entire book. <laughs> I'm told that's step four in the recovery process. And step five is no PowerPoint. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> but Africa is really where the, the, the battle for the future of food is the most urgent. It's what the subject of the, uh, of the discussion tonight, and that's what I want to talk about. It's where hunger is the most severe. It's where soils are the most degraded. Agriculture is the least productive. And it's where climate change is projected to have some of the most devastating consequences uh, on farmers and on the poor. It's also where the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, and donor governments are aggressively exporting this industrial model of agriculture. They're doing that um, through the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, as Simone indicated. Um, the, the Alliance for a Green Re Revolution in Africa is the attempt by, um, initiated by the Gates Foundation in 2006, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation and then a variety of, of donor governments um, throwing in money, um, is the argument is that the first Green Revolution, which people may or may not uh, be aware of, was the, the attempt to put high yield seeds, commercial seeds and, and chemical fertilizers in the hands of farmers to increase their productivity. And it's credited, rightly or wrongly, with um, dramatically increasing productivity in India, parts of Latin America, other parts of Asia. Um, and um, the, it bypassed Africa for a whole variety of reasons. And now the Gates Foundation argues we have the seed technologies and all the rest to give Africa its own special, specially tailored green revolution to modernize its, produ its production. Um, and the main vehicle for doing that um, is the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa and then donor and then national governments putting subsidies in place to allow small farmers to buy seeds and commercial fertilizers. Um, I start the book with the Malawi miracle. It's called the Malawi miracle because about 12 years ago, after three crop failures in five years, the the government of Malawi, a small landlocked country on the southeastern, in the southeastern part of, of Africa, um, actually thumbed their noses at the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, who were telling them governments shouldn't subsidize anything. And they said, forget it. We're going to subsidize our farmers to grow more food, and we're going to do it by giving them commercial seeds and fertilizers. They gave them coupons to purchase discount seeds and fertilizers, and it worked. It worked to increase corn production. That's what the seeds were for. It was all for corn. Main staple crop in the country, main, main, main food source for, for people in Malawi. Um, and corn production doubled and even tripled one year in the first years after they started this program. Jeffrey Sachs proclaimed that a green revolution for Africa may be possible after all Malawi has proved it can be done. I entered in 2013 about six years after this program had uh, begun and you could already see it unraveling. Um, the, any soil scientist could have told you why it would unravel. Um, but it was shocking to see it uh, fall apart so, so quickly. The problem is that synthetic fertilizers do nothing to increase the fertility of the soil. I wished we could rebrand them with a name other than fertilizer. It provides nutrients to plants, but it does not rebuild soil. 
Um, and what happens in Malawi is that these poor farmers get these subsidies for fertilizer. They start using this. They start growing only corn because that's what's subsidized. And they find that they need more and more fertilizer every year just to get the same results because the soil is getting less fertile, not more fertile. Um, it's a classic pattern. India actually experienced the same pattern um, with its green revolution. Um, the result is that um, they can't afford more fertilizer, they can't afford more seeds, and production declines. Yields flatten out and then start to decline, and that's what we started to see in Malawi. I've argued that pouring fertilizer onto a monoculture of corn is a little like putting trout in a trout pond at the beginning of the spring. Sure, people can come fish trout out of that pond later in, later in the summer, Farmers can pull some corn out of their land if they pour fertilizer into, the land, into, the, into their soil, but the land is no more capable of sustaining life than it was before. In fact, it's less so. The land grows more acidic and less fertile. Today, the saddest part of the Malawi story is that even with that increase in corn production, hunger indicators barely moved. They did not reduce rural poverty. They did not reduce hunger in any significant degree. Again, hunger amid plenty. Why do we keep getting it so wrong that just growing more food is going to solve hunger? It doesn't. What does work, and I saw these examples everywhere I went for this book, um, is that farmer organizations, like the, one, uh, the ones I met doing the Malawi agroecology, farmer to farmer agroecology project in the central Malawian town of Lobi, um, and the surrounding villages. Um, farmer groups are taking the initiative to do it a different way, to reject the Green Revolution model and realize that the future is in the soil and in rebuilding their soils. Um, what they do in this community is they actually found a beautiful and nutritious bright orange variety of corn that they don't have to buy every year <coughs> from, the, from, the, from the agro dealer networks that Agra sets up, um, it actually can, they can save the seeds year to year. It was growing in one neighboring community in, the villa, in one village, and they realized it was really high in vitamin A, super nutritious. Um, uh, vitamin A is a serious deficiency in a lot of the developing world in Malawi, causes blindness, lots of other um, health problems. Here it was, right growing among them. They propagated it, they disseminated it to their, uh, spread it in, the, in their communities, and they didn't just grow it, grow maize, teach, get people to grow more maize, more corn. They actually started this project to create diet diversity because they realized that the whole diet in the country was way too corn dependent. Um, so the, the whole theory was pr promote crop diversity as a way of promoting diet diversity. And to do that, they intercropped all kinds of different crops in alongside the corn, and um, in that process, um, developed an entire agroecology model that rebuilt the soil, diversified diets, diversified crops, and um, made, the, made the communities far more resilient to climate change. Why? Their soils held water better when droughts came they wouldn't lose as, as much of their crops. They had roots in the soil all the time from the things they were growing. S storms and floods wouldn't wash away their topsoil as much. Um, and possibly most importantly, when a drought killed their corn, they had something else in the ground that didn't get killed and that would sustain their families. So it's an insurance policy against, uh, a nutritional insurance policy against climate change. Remarkable project. I heard farmer after farmer sing the praises of this. And, and you would think, I would think that a government would look at a project like this, see that they're, spe that they're spending 60% of their entire agricultural budget on these crazy subsidies for seeds and fertilizers, and they'd say, wow, this is a low-cost alternative that can really feed the hungry. That's not what happened. What happened was they developed a seed policy on the template offered up by the Gates Foundation um, for seed policy reform, because all, all of this aid comes with conditions. You need to be making your, your policies more business friendly. Um, 
and the seed policy strengthens the rights of commercial plant breeders like Monsanto and the other multinationals who are selling seeds there and actually threatened to, the first draft of this policy threatened to um, outlaw the sale, exchange, and, and, and um, saving of farmer seeds. 80% Far of crops in Africa are produced using seeds that farmers save from one harvest to the next. That's been agriculture's story forever. Commercial seeds you have to buy every year and hit with fertilizer or they won't be productive. Um, that's the treadmill that the companies want to get farmers on. Um, this policy threatened to make it illegal for farmers to, do, to, to actually um, keep that traditional practice going. And it even went so far as to call, say that farmers could no longer call their bright orange kernel of corn, which they could plant and would grow, would grow another nice corn crop, um, they couldn't call it seed. It could only be called grain, because grain being something that um, something worthy of eating, but not of planting. Outrageous. Um, Malawi's when when I actually took on somebody who was defending the seed policy, I I, I got exacerbated. Exas exacer exasperated with him and I said, I said, Tamani, this policy is so bad it could have been written by Monsanto. And he, I'm telling you, he looked at his shoes, he looked up and he said, well, a former Monsanto official was one of the authors of the policy. And that's kind of the moral of the story of the book and the moral of the story of these policies. For, the companies are there writing the laws that will sell more of their products. Monsanto controlled controls 50% of the commercial seed market in, um, in Malawi. Um, I can't stop without talking a little bit about the US because agribusiness influence is perhaps most developed and, and dominant in the United States. Um, and that's what I found in my, I do a chapter on Iowa as part of a section I call the roots of our problems. Uh, where did this crazy model of agriculture come from? Why are we exporting it to the rest of the world? And how's it working for Iowans? Um, not very well as it turned out. Iowa is indeed blanketed with corn and soybeans as far as the eye can see, dotted with ethanol refineries and factory hog farms and the occasional windmill. Um, every piece of Iowa's, in industrial model of agriculture is threatened and implicated by climate change. It is um, a mess. Half the topsoil's gone, uh, they're depleting their water supplies, the water is polluted from all the runoff from the agricultural lands. Des Moines has the largest denitrification water purification plant in the world to take the nitrates that have flow, come, uh, the fertilizer not taken up in the land that flows into the rivers and flows down to Des Moines. Um, but here's the thing, even in, even in Iowa, the solutions are all around us. That's what, I say, that's what I found in this book. And even in Iowa, I met Matt Liebman, this wonderful agricultural ecologist working at Iowa State University, has this great program where he's experimenting with this traditional corn and soybean plant, uh, rotation of crops that is what, what all, uh, all farmers in Iowa do. And he said, what if we added one more rotation of grasslands that could be used for hay, um, for animals, or could be grazed, or could be used for other purposes? What if we just added one rotation? How would that affect the environmental problems we're seeing? Turns out, he's documented, it would give an 85% reduction in fertilizer use, a 97% reduction in herbicide use, a complete elimination of water pollution from runoff, a um, elimination of, of uh, soil erosion, and a building of the fertility of the soil instead of a depleting of it. I asked him, I said, look, this is a win-win, this is the win-win everybody's looking for. How many farmers are using this? And he said, well, almost none. I was like, why? And he said, well, I'll read you his quote. I could not have devised a program that affected more of the state's agribusinesses. Take this home with you. Like, if something isn't happening that makes, seems like it makes, it's a no-brainer, it makes perfect sense, and it's in the public interest, if it's not happening, ask who's benefiting from it not happening. 85% fertilizer reduction, Coke Industries and the other fertilizer 
companies are not going to be into that. 97% reduction in herbicide use, Monsanto is absolutely not on board with that. Growing less corn and soybeans would raise the price of soybeans, great for farmers. Their prices are really low now. Guess what? It would raise the cost of feed costs for Smithfield and Tyson and the other factory farms. It would raise the cost of corn for Archer Daniels Midlands ethanol refineries. Just, that's what I found everywhere I went in researching this book. If a pro proposed reform threatened agribusiness interests, companies, really the sales or profits, it was not gonna get enacted. Agribusiness spent $133 million in to, for lobbying in Washington. It's, it's more than the defense industry spends in Washington. So ultimately, what we really have to realize is that in the battle for the future of food, these companies are the main obstacles to change. And if we're going to get any sensible food policies that can adapt to climate change and help us um, deal with the challenges that we face so that everyone can eat tomorrow, we're going to have to recapture our democracies, get money out of politics, and that's going to be crucial to winning the battle for the future of food. So let me stop there. Good evening. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me again to this great place, to Seattle. Thank you very much, C-A-G-J, my two sisters here. And thank you very much, Tim. Tim was actually educating me, it's not me educating him. And I had the opportunity to read his book before uh, it was printed. And uh, it's a really great book. So where is that? Ah, oh, okay, sorry. Um, I, I'm sorry, I have, uh, I have to show you some slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Because I have uh, some graphs that I wanted to show you. <laughs> well, in general, with uh, almost any company or anybody that's, that wants to work in, in Africa, we have an agreement. Population explosion, land and forest degradation, decreasing in biodiversity, cultural erosion, Unplanned urbanization, urbanization is important, but unplanned urbanization is no good, and climate change. But agriculture is the most important thing to, to, to work with, especially in uh, continents like Africa. In Ethiopia, over 80% of the people are agricultural. So if we don't address agriculture, then we're messed up. And the uh, easiest example to show you is is this diagram. You see, in 1987, this land was really green. And in 2000, I cannot even see the, the year. Um, 2001 or whatever? Yeah, in 2012. If I have another a satellite map of 2018, it will be much worse. And this is happening because of agriculture. So if we don't address agricultural issues, then we are missing up our environment, big time. So to address those problems that I have told you, there are two paradigms. One paradigm is a productivist paradigm, and the other paradigm is called an agroecological paradigm. That's a, there is a war between the two paradigms in Africa. I think all over the world, you know, if we hear what Tim was saying. The productivist paradigm. We can ask, what is the purpose of agriculture? Is it to produce more food? Yeah, we need to produce more food because the population is increasing. But we can ask another question. Is it to produce more food, but which is nutritious and healthy? Yeah? Then we'll have a different policy than the previous one. Is it to produce more food, nutritious and healthy food, without impacting the environment? the policy is totally different. We can even ask another question. 
Is it to produce more food, nutritious food, without impacting the environment? And culturally appropriate. You all ate injera today. Eh? Injera is very critical for us, for Ethiopians. So cultural appropriateness of food is very, very much important. And you have a different policy. Then you can even ask another question, is it to, to, to produce more food, healthy food, nutritious food, without impacting the environment and culturally appropriate and in a just way, justice, food justice, then you have a totally different policy. But this policy, the policy by, uh, by companies and philanthropic capitalists, you know, is a productivist policy. And these are its characteristics mainly. They use agrochemicals. You know what the agrochemicals are, pesticides and uh, fertilizers. I agree with you that we should find another name for them. High yielding varieties irrigation, and focusing on technology, emerging technologies. You know, we all need technology, but the question is, what kind of technology owns technology? And, and training farmers, new techniques, knowledge substitution. I'll come to this point later on. Um, who is pushing the productivist paradigm? The first question, how do we produce more food? These are philanthropic capitalists. Quite recently, the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, USAID, and now the DFID have come up with a, with a program called Partnership for Inclusive Agricultural Transformation in Africa. PIATA. is a great name, huh? but a very bad program. Because what does agricultural transformation mean? Transformation is a big agenda. It, it, it talks about the transformation of social and ecological reality of an area. So it's a big agenda, and uh, we don't know about it. Africans don't know about it. As you know, everybody has a solution for Africa. Everybody has a solution for Africa. Yeah? So philanthropic capitalists, the Gates and the Rockefellers and others, Development agents like USA, DFID, BMZ, you know, German BMZ, business, local scientists, and government, government bureaucracy are pushing the productivist paradigm in Africa. So, oh my God. So, a narrative. What is the narrative of industrial agriculture? What are they saying? One, the, 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 the new narrative is oh, business. We have to open business. We have to open spaces for business in Africa, and we're changing our policy and infrastructure and a lot of training for, for making Africa open to business, big business. Farmers see this is part of the problem and should be replaced by patented hybrids. That's the narrative now in Africa. Problem of calories, so more calories is the solution. That's part of the productivist paradigm. Land should be given to those who can make it I mean, productive, and that's what is driving land grabbing in Africa. Knowledge comes from science. You know, our farmers were farming for thousands of years. They have a detailed knowledge of the soil, the seeds, and whatever, but their knowledge should be replaced. And it's possible to produce a one-fits-all solutions. You know, people, when, what makes me wonder is when people talk about Europe, they talk about, uh, you know, um, France, UK, and, and Germany, but when people talk about Africa, they talk about as if it's one country. Even my country is such a diverse country, so you cannot produce one policy. What is the impact of the, pro the productivist paradigm? And Tim was talking about this. Triple burden of malnutrition. You know, there is a lot of production, but there is still hunger, there is still micronutrient deficiencies and obesity and non-communicable diseases. Their environmental unsustainability. You know, biodiversity losses, weather pollution, um, loss of resilience, climate change. There is social inequalities and neglect of cultural values. Down there, you see lock-ins. What are these lock-ins? Sometimes you take a direction. For example, now we are saying that we need to use hybrid seeds, we need to use chemicals, agrochemicals, and we are replacing farmer's knowledge. Once you go into that direction, it's very difficult to come out. 
We are seeing this in Malawi. Very, very difficult. If you go to farmers, they told you that the soil is corrupted. You have to give it fertilizers to operate. So that's a locking. You locked in into a system. So what we are promoting as the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa is what we call agroecology. I'm so happy to report that as a team is a team can be a witness here, agroecology is expanding, it's developing quite recently in Rome at FAO. Um, the international community has accepted a report by the high level of panelists on, on sustainability of food. So agroecology. Agroecology is action and change that brings sustainability and resistance to all parts of the food system. Ecological, economic, cultural, and social. That's what's agroecology. It's a science. It's a cutting-edge science. It's a science. People talk about, when you talk about agroecology, it's, a, it's backward or it's going backward. But it's a cutting edge science in so many different areas. It's a practice, practice, you know, compost making, in siloing, in bio, uh, bio fertilizers. It's a range, 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 range of meters to do agroecology. So it's, it's, a, it's a practice. But it's a social movement also. It's a social movement. So agroecology is these three things it's a science, practice, and a social movement. And it is this three or it's not agroecology. So the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, we called ourselves food sovereignty, not food security. Why did we call ourselves food sovereignty? Because food sovereignty does not, food security does not care how the food was produced. Food security does not care whether the food that you eat is culturally appropriate or not. Food security does not care about the ownership of uh, your seed, your land, your, 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 uh, your life in general. So we chose a name, um, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. So the purpose is to create a single African voice. Some years ago, we go to international meetings and we're not speaking the same language. Now we are bringing African civil society, African farmers and pastoralists together as one, so it's to create a single African voice. Um, the number is not, we can potentially reach up to 200 million farmers, or African citizens. AFSA believes in championing small African family farming production systems through agroecology and farmers managed system. That's one hand. But on the other hand, we do fight also. Resisting the corporate industrialization of African agriculture seed and land grabs. That's what we do. These are the numbers. In Africa, this is uh, the spread of AFSA, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Out of the 55 African countries, we operate in 50 of them. So these are the working groups. We have a land working group, a citizen working group, a seed working group, and a climate change agroecology working group. So this is our uh, theory of change. Um, quite recently, we said, does agroecology work in Africa? We just asked this question. Or are we inheriting this concept from, from Latin America? So we started to do research, and we researched it in all these countries. So 50 case studies were produced, and, uh, and we published them on our website, this, this, uh, these stories. And we published them in the form of a book. So if, let me tell you one or two stories. One is a never-ending food in Malawi. In Malawi, there's a, a permaculture initiative. So two, a couple went to Malawi, and they had a meeting with Malawian women. And they have asked them um, you know, whether they have traditional vegetables, vegetable varieties. And they came up with 300, 300 varieties of uh, vegetables. And they start to grow this in a permaculture way. And now they, are, you know, they have a, a very rich nutrition in Malawi through this system. Thousands of farmers. This is Ankole Longhorn in Uganda. It was lost because it was uh, replaced by high hybrids, hybrid cattle. But the hybrids couldn't perform in this kind of dry environment. It was a, a very bad policy from the, evening, from the beginning. 
So um, the, a, an institution in Uganda started to go back to these uh, um, longhorns of Uganda in, in this working. And leafy vegetables is a fantastic story. In uh, Kenya, some years ago, uh, leafy vegetables were considered as, as, a, as backward. You, know? you don't eat leafy, veg leafy vegetables. But now suddenly the interest in leafy vegetables has increased. Uh, you can get leafy vegetables in, in uh, supermarkets. And because of that, farmers are producing it in troughs. So there is nutrition at home level and there is, is market. This is uh, the system of, there is a system called the system of uh, rice imp imp implementation. Now it's a, it's a system of crop um, intensification in Ethiopia. In crop intensification, instead of uh, broadcasting any, when, you, when you sow the seeds, instead of doing like that, what you do is you plant them online. And it increases productivity. Because of this, from 10 quintal of F per hectare, they could grow it between 30 and 50 quintal. And that's a huge increase. Because one quintal of TEF is like 200, 2,000 um, burr, Ethiopian burr. 10 of them will be 20,000. If you increase that to 30 quintal, it's 60,000. So the increase is significant. So with management, you can increase productivity. You don't need, you don't need uh, chemical fertilizers to do that, just techniques. This is, an, in Ethiopia, a very dry area. Uh, some years ago, they started to do soil and water conservation and uh, the increasing um, the, uh, the <coughs> development of compost and other methods and treating gullies. And uh, as you can see it, this area has revived. So for the last 15 years or more, the Institute for Sustainable Development was doing study study on barley, durum, durum wheat, maize, teff, and faba bean. And the, 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 res the research was, you know, one of one, the, the blue one, they were not applying anything. On the brown is treating these crops with compost. The, the green one is with chemical fertilizers. As you can see, over the years, you know, the first one or two years, the, the one with the uh, chemical fertilizer was doing good. But over the years, as you can see, compost is doing far better. So, so uh, to conclude, what are the key findings of this 50 research? And we have done much more after that. And there were more researches coming out. What is, what is the conclusion? Do we actually need a productivist approach where you use chemicals in? the variety, so can you go agroecological way? That was the question. So the answer is yes, we can go. A sustainable income increases for the households, higher yields in productivity, drought resistance varieties increase yield. You know, these are the learnings. Organic, organic markets increase uh, income, increase crop diversity, lowers risk, and increases resilience. Obvious, the science. Pesticidal plants work are cost effective, sustainable, and safe using the system of crop intensification. Fields over six tons per hectare have been observed under research conditions. Soil moisture increases reported. Practice, you know, this way. Um, the use of diverse lab varieties, intercropping, organic fertilizer. You can, all, you can do all that. And social movement, formation of farmer groups in all those 50 case studies that, I, that I've shown you. Enhances social capacity and leadership, focusing on rural women and use brings results. And mediators, you know, the NGOs, the small NGOs, we call them mediators, uh, play a huge role in mobilizing farmers. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't go. <laughs> I'm really tempted to ask you about your graph, <laughs> but I won't. The economist in me will, will repress itself once again. Uh, no, actually what I'm, what I'm most struck by in those case studies that, uh, that AFSA has done is that it documents kind of what I saw all over the world, that there are these um, pretty well-developed solutions all around us. And I'm curious what, 
you think the lock-ins are that are preventing governments in Africa from taking those up, and what role the Gates Foundation and these programs like AGRA are, um, are playing in that kind of lock-in? The International Panel of uh, Experts on the Sustainability of Food has identified eight lock-ins. But I can talk about three of them. I think one lock-in is once, as, I, as I've said, once you 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 uh, buy some machines, um, and the soils are um, the soils are exposed to some some of these chemicals and are used to these chemicals, and the crops are used to these chemicals. And once you have uh, um, replace the seeds of farmers with these uh, uh, improved varieties. They don't have their seeds already. They are already locked in. And the other locking is the, the comparison. When you compare productivity, if you compare only one crop, probably, you know, th this one would be much better than the other. But if you go to rural areas, they would, they would intercrop, you know? There will be different crops. So do you compare it on nutrition? Is, do you put in nutrition? Do you, do you put uh, environmental sustainability into the mix? Do you, do you put in justice? Or do you put in cultural appropriateness? of food? When you put all these elements uh, into the mix of comparing the productivity or the goodness of one farming system or another, that, that, that becomes clear, but governments are already locked in because they only count productivity in one crop. And they will be locked in into markets. For example, there is a, a, an effort uh, in Ethiopia linking up some uh, farmers, not only in Ethiopia, in Senegal, I know that's happening, in Togo that's happening, linking up uh, farmers with companies. Yeah? So farmers would produce some, some, some crops, and they are linked with, with companies. So instead of planting uh, their own diverse plants, they, they will only produce for the market. So that they, are, they are locked into that system down the, the, down the line. Um, Gates, you know, Gates is the most powerful person in Africa. I'm saying this too, because he can, he can call anybody. He can, he can come to uh, any of the countries and go straight into any of the offices. Uh, so he's very powerful. Anything that he promotes can happen in most of the cases because he has the money, the money, the money to, to make it happen. Uh, that's, why, that's why he frightens us, you know. Um, if he had a very good idea, agroecological idea, that would be fantastic, you know, he would be our champion. But he's pushing uh, the kind of agriculture that's happening in Malawi that you, are, that you have reported really nicely in your book. So that's what is, uh, that, that's what is, uh, is a problem. That's what is this Piata initiative that I talked about. Yeah, well, I, about. I mean, I think the, uh, it's striking how much it's captured the, 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 the narrative for, I mean, I say in the book that the Gates Foundation was incredibly lucky to start their agricultural development program in AGRA, um, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, in 2006. The food price crisis happens in 2007 and 8, and guess what? Suddenly, everyone realizes that African countries, that every country should grow more of their own food, and here is the Gates Foundation with the ready-made answer to the question, how should you grow your own, grow more food with our technologies? Um, but one of the things that I documented, and I'm curious how you see this, um, um, I know you've mentioned it in some of the case studies, is that one of the perverse aspects of this, um, these subsidies that fund only chosen crops, is that they drive production into those crops and out of mm. traditional crops. So there's a huge loss of well, seed diversity mm -hmm. from, from farmers um, as they stop farming the things they traditionally farmed. But nutritious and climate resilient crops like millet, we documented in our research that in this, the time of this, uh, 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 that, that this program's been going, that um, the land planted, planted to pearl millet, which is a very hardy, um, uh, very resilient and very nutritious grain, has gone down 35 percent 
the production has gone down almost by half. Um, and that's land getting shifted into corn and shifted into other crops. But I'm wondering, the seed issue I know is huge for, for, for farmers in Africa. I don't know, I mean, um, uh, in my research, I went to one of the communities in Ethiopia and they were having a discussion about their seeds. They had 19 varieties of barley. One barley. nine, barley. Yeah. Different kinds of barley. And all those barleys, and if you look at them, you wouldn't know them. They are very much associated with their own culture. They are the variety of barley given to women when they um, give birth, and uh, you know, varieties of barley for local alcoholic drinks, varieties of barley for children, varieties of barley for every purpose. Out of 19, when we went there, the farmers were left with five. Five, similar with wheat. If you go to the northern part of the country, there are over 100 varieties of wheat. Sorghum, the same thing. Ethiopia is one of the Vavilovian centers, as you know. It's centers of diversity there. Some people say they are 11, some people say they are 13, but the most critical ones are five. And Ethiopia is one of them. And imagine, and this is, this is bad to everybody, even to Monsanto, even to companies, you know, because they need these seeds as a, as a genetic, uh, um, what do you call it, as a genetic heritage to develop even new varieties. They're very much important. So it's a, it's a loss for everybody. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I saw that everywhere. I mean, the, I, I kind of hate doing these events where we leave people feeling so depressed about the state of the world. In fact, when, remember when I told you about Francis Moore LePay giving me good advice on the book early on and that the book was much better because of her advice? Um, her advice was, I think I could almost quote her, she said, you know, Tim, you might be writing a really depressing book <laughs> and you might not want to just depress people. And I already was aware of that, but she made me, she, she really was making the point that you really need to spotlight these um, these inspiring stories that are going on everywhere, and they really are going on everywhere. I'll tell you the inspiring story that I'm most excited about now, and this relates to that question of how do you confront agribusiness power. You get government power, and there's a new government in place in Mexico, took office in December, and that government is promising and taking action right now to ban the cultivation of genetically modified corn, which Monsanto and the other companies have been trying to get permission to plant in the country for six years. Um, so, so this is also another question, is like, how do we get, and where do you see hope for getting government action in Africa from African governments to take some of these measures more seriously? A quite recent example is, when I was at FAO, I was called for a meeting about an agroecology initiative in West Africa. So the West African governments, uh, five of them went to develop an agroecology policy. So they have hired somebody, a, a consultant from, from uh, Europe, I mean from, from FAO. Uh, and I know one of, one of the consultants and then they were asking me how they can work with, with AFSA. And now the commissar, said, why do we do it on five countries? Why don't we do it in 10 countries? 10 francophone countries to develop a program and a policy on agroecology. That's very, very much uh, encouraging for me. Yeah. And uh, um, what is my, my more encouraging is previously, FAO was considered as a citadel of uh, industrial agriculture. Now they have a, a branch in, the, in their office, in their structure. Um, for agroecology. And in Africa, in almost all parts of Africa, they have an agroecology representative for FAO. So when FAO speaks, you know, government would follow. So I have, I have a huge hope. Um, in a very strange way also, the crisis that we are in now, the recognition of the crisis, um, the Greta Gutenberg uh, kind of, you know, children initiative and whatever, is giving me hope because people are realizing that we have to reduce the carbon out of the atmosphere, and the best way of doing that 
is to do agroecological farming. The best. Yeah, no, yeah. I think that's right. I think that's right. And, and we were both in Rome for these um, annual meetings, uh, sort of an annual food summit. And one of the most encouraging things that came out of that was an endorsement by the, um, by the representatives of the governments gathered there of a new report on agroecology as one of the key innovations partly to address climate change. It's a sea change in the narrative. We'll see if we can make it a sea change in policy, but it's a complete change in the discussion because the, the dominant narrative was business as usual is not an option. It's not working. We're in a climate crisis. We're in an ecological crisis, and we need to change. Uh, change the way we do things. I think we wanted to move now to um, allow you to ask some questions, and I think what they'd like people to do is come up to the one mic here, um, and uh, we'll take some questions and uh, try to give you nice, short, succinct answers. Thank you so much, Tim and Million. Can we give them a just appreciation? <laughs> I also just, we invited um, all of our elected leaders, local leaders, and um, we're very honored that Senator Bob Hasegawa is here with us. Thank you so much, State Senator Bob Hasegawa. <clears throat> Longtime ally of social movements. And um, earlier, District Representative, a representative Adam Smith's office, Garrett Moore, was, was here with us during the reception as well. So we just want to acknowledge them both. Thank you. Hello. Um, Monsanto, we're not going to persuade, but the Gates Foundation is basically run by the Gateses, and I think they're trying to do good. And is your book going to change, that, change them? And if not, what, we can, what can we do? We are in, here in Seattle. I go to fundraising uh, parties that are neighbors of the Gateses. And I'm wondering if we can have some influence on, on him. What is it that's holding him up? And what can you talk to this? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right, thank, thank you. Um, it's kind of a yes and. So your talks were all about the farmers. Uh, my work, uh, two, two connected questions. My work's the next stage down. My work is in investing in the aggregators and the processors of the food coming from the farmers. Uh, so what do you see from that angle, and really, do you see investing into those companies as anything like what Gates doing? Are we doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Um. Hi, guys. Uh, my question actually relates to, or you might want to relate it to the first question. I wanted you to talk a little bit about the, the intellectual uh, and uh, associated institutional drivers of these narratives. The narratives don't exist by themselves. What I'm thinking of is, for example, most of the agricultural ministers in African countries were trained at places like Iowa State and Michigan State and Washington State, and most of them read the same magazines that are read by the U guys in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, et cetera. There is an intellectual, institutional uh, thing. Um, and that, of course, is what Gates is tapping into. That's the one he knows. So that's a tough nut, I think, to crack. And I'd be interested in your comment. So as an economist, maybe you know about Amartya Sen, <laughs> whose uh, research suggested that uh, in no place that wasn't truly democratic has there ever been a famine. And both of you ha were talking about governance. And I think sometimes when we talk about agroecology and the ways we want to see agriculture moving, it's more about like decision making, um, about our agricultural systems. And I guess my question is how do we move ourselves more towards a place where we're making, where we feel like we have the power to make good decisions and we're helping the people in our communities understand the kinds of decisions that they can be a part of, you know, not just like the food they can buy, but like how can we all participate in that decision making for a better agricultural system? Yeah, thanks. You want to start out? Okay. All great questions. I think that's why uh, 
I was talking about justice in the food system, you know, when, when we talk about food, it's not only productivity, justice should be at the center of it. And you have to participate in, in, um, in the, not in the production, but as a consumer, you can also make uh, an impact if you organize yourself, uh, uh, that is, and if you organize yourself and push for a policy, maybe individual actions are they good? I mean, maybe they're not, you know, big. But organize yourself and organize with uh, organizers, and, and you can you can have an impact. Uh, Gates Foundation, um, the way the educational system, our educational system is structured, um, actually it, it does not help us to serve our people or to know our people. Um, elites in Africa are much more closer, as you're saying, to the other elites all over the world than to their own people. Even those who are products of agricultural universities, um, they don't go back to the community and understand uh, the kind of farming that they do. And their, their recommendation to the people, to the, to the farmers, does not come out of understanding of the system. We just look at the Western system as a successful agricultural system, and they wanted to emulate that. And that, that's uh, part of the big problem. Maybe Gate is getting those kind of people. He's sitting around the table. They speak his language. He speaks their language. They can agree. And that's, maybe that's where the decision is made. How do you, influ you influence Gate? Probably. If he comes and talks with African farmers, African civil societies, and here's another perspective, maybe that's a possibility. Huh? Otherwise, it's in, I don't see how we can change it. We, we, we do write, we do publish. I don't know whether he gets those, uh, our publication. Um, so the best way is to, to, for him to really sit, take time and sit and understand the other perspective. Maybe that will be the solution, I think. Um, I think investment in aggregates, I mean, uh, across the food, uh, the food system, as part of the food system, and across the food chain, everybody can contribute, you know? You can uh, know, where, you can influence where you are accessing the food. If you are accessing uh, agroecologically produced food, then you are encouraging farmers to produce more agroecological food. In that way, you can be part of the solution. I, I think that's the only thing that I can say. Yeah, I think the, uh, I think the agri, I'll, I'll start, I'll go backwards from the way you went, just to follow up on that. About, uh, what aggregators are, are um, often small, produce, small operations in um, rural communities that are um, helping farmers take their product and get it into a, a, a form that can get it to market, that can also get it into a form that is higher value. Um, and that's one of the key things that cooperatives I've seen do in, in parts of Africa that are brilliant, um, um, where, where cooperatives have been able to um, develop their own aggregation systems or where they partnered with local businesses to create these kind of aggregation systems. They can get double the price for their rice. Um, that they were getting when they just were selling raw rice to somebody who could buy it, right? And that's, that's tremendous for rural development for food security, right? Because your uh, farmers have more, more in their pockets, they have money to invest. I saw some great projects that did that, and I saw some great cooperatives that had developed that kind of level of, of, of um, capacity. And I saw international projects that were actually promoting local African business development to play that aggregation role, which is completely different from, I guess you could call them agribusinesses, but it's a completely different um, role from multinational agribusiness coming in and displacing local um, actors in those markets. Um, on the Gates Foundation, I have to say, I hear this question every time I talk about the book, some version of the question, and it's because people are really perplexed by the image the Gates Foundation has for you know, trying to do good works. And I'm willing to say that they're trying to do good works, that they think they're trying to do good works. 
the thing is, and this was brought home to me by someone who, who presented with me in Washington, Ricardo Salvador, former Iowa State economist, ecologist, now works for the Union of Concerned Scientists. He said, look, I was working for a foundation when the Gates Foundation started its program in, in, in agriculture, and they asked for advice from a lot of us who were in the foundation world, and I gave him some advice, and he didn't take it. I wish he'd taken it, but he didn't. And the thing I can tell you is that he has an absolutely maniacal commitment to technology as the solution to everything, and a commitment to large corporations as being the ones that can deliver technology. So he said he told the crowd, it's probably not a good idea to wait for Bill, Bill Gates to offer solutions that aren't uh, corporate-based and technology-driven. I think that's the truth. Um, I think, but what I would add is that I think he's driving the narrative in a place like Africa, but he's not he doesn't have to control the narrative in a place like Africa. And that gets back to this question of democracy. It's like, at what point does a Malawian government or another government say, geez, it makes no sense to spend 60% of our agricultural bu budget on these subsidies that aren't working, that are, seem to be actually being counter, are actually counterproductive. Why don't we try something else? And, and let's stop this this process. Let's get off this, this train. Um, it's very difficult to see African governments doing that, but, a, but AFSA's current campaign of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa is to try to push um, African governments to incorporate into their climate adaptation plans, the formal plans they need to have for um, how they're going to adapt to climate change. Um, a plank for agroecology is a piece of that strategy. And that is a very strategic thing to do because it opens a lane for an alternative way of thinking that Gates isn't gonna fund and Gates isn't gonna support, but that can demonstrate its validity on the ground just like AFSA's members have all along. Um, the lock-in that, um, that Phil mentioned about, about sort of the intellectual lock-in that happens with the, you know, where the Gates model comes from, Western development agencies forever have played God. They want to create the world in their own image. Everything's supposed to look like Iowa. The reason I wrote a chapter about Iowa is because it's not working for Iowans. They're drinking poisoned water. They are going, the, uh, what the University of Minnesota estimates that Iowa's corn yields are, will probably go down 20 to 50% because of climate change and resource degradation over the next 50 years. They're producing ethanol, somebody pointed this out, so they're producing ethanol and fighting to get more corn into ethanol when the, when the United States is going for electric vehicles. It's like you want a bigger share of a shrinking market, that's the future, that's the thing. These policies in Africa are the failing policies of the present that are the failed policies of the past. Agroecology is the future. And that's what we need to be betting on when we're looking at a climate change future, or changing climate that really threatens our, our future together. Um, that's why I'm encouraged by that these small, these small initiatives can demonstrate the validity of that approach. Governments can recognize it if the governments change and become more responsive, and it can be scaled up. Mexico is now uh, implementing an FAO-funded policy for agroecology in the southern part of the country that is built on models that I've been seeing develop in Mexico for 30 years, but it's now getting government support. That's what's gonna change things. I think that's a great place to wrap up. If you're all right with that. Thank you so much for staying with us tonight. Um, Again, Community Alliance for Global Justice is a membership-led grassroots organization. You can become a member just by signing a card there at our table and back. Um, we're happy to talk with anybody who's interested in learning more about our Augur Watch campaign. Um, and please just join me one more time in thanking Emiliana and Tim for a wonderful evening. <laughs>